Yeah, day there. Once again, viewers, this is your mate Kamikaze78 here, coming to you guys with some more Planet Side 2 content. Today, guys, we have got some new toys to get our hands on. Just under a month ago, the Planet Side 2 developers unveiled the contents of the next major game update, with key inclusions being things like the Colossus Tank, the NS66 Punisher SMG, and base modules that players can craft in the War Asset system. Well, guys, today, those exact systems, alongside a bunch of the other changes, have made it to the public test server after the development stream that was ran today and, well, it's quite simple. We're going to spend some time going over everything and how it feels from a gameplay perspective. There are some things discussed in the development stream in regards to long-term plans that we aren't going to go over in this video. We're going to do that in another video because there's simply so much to go over, too much to go over in today's video. Anyway, let's get started. Let's start off with the initial testing and gameplay of the staple piece of this update, the poster child if you will, the Colossus Tank. For those who have missed out on the previous announcements regarding this thing, a quick rundown for you guys. This is a giant, five-seater beast of a tank that is a new war asset item craftable by Outfits, and serves a primary function of taking down enemy Bastion fleet carriers with its giant mammoth cannon controlled by the driver. There are also four gunner positions which we will go over shortly as well. Now as far as the main cannon is concerned it fires a slow moving projectile that does feature a significant amount of drop over range while the tank is mobile but also sports the capacity to one shot infantry and ESFs alike. Against enemy armor you are looking between two to eight shots depending on the vehicle which I've overlaid on your screen currently. But yeah the main cannon overall isn't something that should be scoffed at if you will. But I can imagine that some of you are wondering, Kami, how does a weapon that sports, from what I can tell, a pretty horrendous muzzle velocity act as a threat to bastions while they are hundreds of meters in the sky? Well, enter the Colossus's main party trick, the Skylance Battery Deployment Ability. This passive ability allows the tank to deploy and change the configuration of its primary weapon to become a sort of anti-aircraft railgun-like system, if you will. The Mammoth Cannon is locked to a higher elevation and fires a beam-style weapon that after a small charge-up period will pierce multiple targets, causing incredible amounts of damage. The piercing ability also applies to the hulls of the Bastion fleet carriers, which, when paired with the Bastion hardpoint targeting systems unique to this tank, it gives the Colossus the ability to target any Bastion hardpoint from the ground with unparalleled accuracy, and honestly, take down some aircraft with it in the process. However, this unparalleled accuracy does come at a cost. The firepower from the gun causes the overheating that is so extreme that the Colossus actually receives a thousand HP worth of damage every time you fire the gun while it's deployed. Now, when you deploy in this vehicle, you're also going to spawn a Quartium Shield with a 15 meter radius. This is a Bombardment Shield, basically acting as a key ingredient to this tank's survivability. It is a big tank, it's easy to hit, so when it is deployed and an easy target, having this shield up ensures that you're going to survive a lot, lot longer, even under the fire of Bastion Bombardment. Now, in addition to that, the Colossus tank also has the ability known as the Mass Accelerator Drive, or MAD for short, an ability that drains some of the vehicle's onboard Cordium storage, but in turn allows you to use the Skylance battery's weapon mechanics while mobile. In other words, the weapon performs very much like a railgun that pierces multiple targets with a 100% increase to muzzle velocity, and in addition deals 25% extra damage. But in turn, it will also overheat the weapon and cause the same amount of damage that you would expect out of the Skylance battery deployment, so it's worth keeping that in mind. You can, however, upgrade this ability to lessen the damage caused by the overheating. So when you combine this with the fact that the vehicle does have the Quartium powered bubble shield that needs to be maintained by supporting ants, this is truly a vehicle that armor columns will exist entirely to support when used right, and can create huge areas of denial for Bastion fleet carries and even enemy armor if played right. Now the developers did make it very clear that you can actually customize this tank on a personal level despite it being a war asset item so every player can have a different Colossus tank build if they choose to. Namely you have a couple of defensive slots, one in which allows for your bombardment shield to take 
a little bit more punishment under fire. And help, you've also got another option that can give your tank the ability to survive a direct strike from an orbital strike if you find yourself being on the receiving end of those more often than not. Definitely a unique upgrade that adds a much needed counter to the ever-growing number of orbital strikes hitting Araxis daily nowadays. I mean... Honest to God, it surprises me that the planet still stands nowadays. Anyway, there are also some additional logistics customization options that allow you to turn the Colossus into an AMS spawn point while it's deployed, which is actually rather cool. And you can also spec it more so towards improved damage mitigation of the overheat mechanic, or you can even customize to improve its quartium efficiency. Lots of different routes to go down, and it looks like progression on this tank is tied down to merit currency for the most part, so we can at least see something to sink our excess merit into with this upcoming update. The last bit of customization we have to play with here is the four gunner positions. As of making this video, we have an option to mount an M12 Goblin S P, which takes on the role of being the Colossus version of the Cobalt, the M20 Gecko, which is the default option and takes a bit more of a resemblance towards the Basilisks. We've also got an M60 Pug, which is your Bulldog equivalent, the M75 Fang, which is actually a smaller cousin to the C75 Viper Cannon from the Lightning which is something I wasn't expecting to see, but a welcome addition. And we've also got the Dingo ML6, which acts similar to your Coyote lock-ons that you will find on ESFs. So there's a lot of flexibility to play with here, and personally, I can't wait to get my hands on this tank at all. It's going to be a lot of fun to roam around in the battlefield with, and it'll be interesting to see how it changes the flow of battle and the size of armor columns in the game, for sure. Anyway, that's the Colossus tank. But that wasn't the only new tool we got to experiment with in this patch, no no. We have something for the more infantry-minded players here too, the NS66 Punisher. This little SMG here, in my opinion, is one of the most unique weapons to have graced the fields of Araxis in recent times, thanks to its ability to have its underbrow grenade launcher change out its payload based on the class that you find yourself using the weapon with. Now, since we last talked about this weapon, we have learned a little bit more about its mechanics surrounding it and how it's going to behave. Firstly, the weapon maintains the same damage model that it featured in the initial screenshots, which proves that this thing is going to be a total menace on the battlefield. Field. A 143 damage model at a 769 rounds per minute fire rate creates some incredible firepower that will see this become a new favourite for a fair few players. However, its small magazine size does seem to lend it towards being a bit more of a guerrilla warfare style weapon, but we will discuss that in an official review when the weapon hits the live servers. In addition, players have got a wide variety of attachment options available on the weapon, including extended magazines, compensators, suppressors, high velocity and soft point ammunition, so the weapon is as modular as you would expect from a nanite systems option but one thing i wasn't expecting is that you can opt to have the weapon inhibit a standard underbarrel he grenade so if you want to go for the more classic underbarrel option on the weapon there is that option for you to explore that is in fact what the weapon will be loaded with by default However, the way you enable the weapon's adaptive underbarrel properties is by equipping the rail attachment slot. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Damn it, this means that I now can't run a laser sight or extended magazines on the weapon if I want to run the cool grenades. This is actually not true. Strangely enough, the game lets you run both the adaptive underbarrel grenade attachment and an additional rail attachment slot, which is actually really cool to see. It makes me wonder if we're going to see a wider sleuth of customization options make their way to other weapons too. But anyway, this was a surprise to see, but once again, a welcome one for sure. In addition, there is a bug right now where you can equip extended magazines on the weapon and the effect of the extended mags applies to the grenade launcher, allowing you to basically spam fire two grenades before needing to reload. Or if you're an engineer, place down an ammo pack and just spam grenades like no tomorrow. Yeah, look. Considering the new mixing and matching of attachments, I'm sure the developers will get this one sorted before it hits the live servers because I can only imagine the chaos we would see. As far as our adaptive underbarrel grenades are concerned, the changes range from major overhauls to non-existent depending on the class that you look at. The infiltrator's grenade still takes the form of an EMP payload, but it does not strip shields, and instead only scrambles HUD elements and destroys deployables. Personally, I'm really happy with this change. I had some pretty major concerns with the initial plans for the EMP payloads, but I think that they found a nice middle ground for it for the time being. The Light Assault's payload of impulse grenades has remained as it was intended, and 
look, I honestly didn't think there was going to be needing any changes here. It's a blast to use. I cannot wait to put this to use in-game and in combat. We're going to see some really nifty plays with this thing as far as I can tell. The combat medic has received one of the most interesting changes to its payload in my opinion. It still provides the healing AoE bonus, but in addition to that, it also will now deactivate any debuffs like flashbangs, and with that, that is going to become an absolute necessity to the point hold meta in my opinion. I think point holding outfits out there are going to adopt this thing like no tomorrow and make it an absolute key necessity on their builds. Engineers have also gained an additional quirk to their payload. The payload will still repair vehicles that are hit by the grenade, but will also provide a soft HP cap increase of 500 health points for 10 seconds. Now, just to clarify, that doesn't mean that you aren't going to see an additional 500 HP added to the vehicle instantly when you hit it with the payload. It just means that you can find yourself repairing your vehicle by an additional 500 HP when the effect is active. This could be interesting to see in action, but I don't know how effective it's going to be in the long run. The Heavy Assault Payload got a total rework, which is good to see because I thought this was the most underwhelming option of the bunch in the initial concepting stages. Now, the Heavy Assault Payload will create a debuff on enemy max suits and vehicles that will prevent them from being able to be repaired for the duration of the debuff, which is going to be a damn powerful element to stopping max crashes or busting enemy sunderers that are well fortified. But yeah guys, that was the second major piece of new content that hit the test servers today. We also now have the facility modules to play around with, but I haven't had a chance to really test them just yet, and probably will wait to see how they perform on the live server in actual gameplay. Not gonna lie, I was a tad underwhelmed by the initial facility modules that they're gonna be releasing, as they seemed a little tame by comparison to some of the initial ideas I thought I saw in the previous dev stream, but it's likely that they're just sort of playing around with this very carefully to see how it impacts the game before going a little bit more crazy with the ideas, which I can understand. I just hope that they do let the creative freedoms run a little wilder in future patches with this concept, because I think the possibilities with the facility modules are just endless here, and you could really change up how bases operate. As of right now, the modules we have to play with include being able to add vehicle nano discounts to bases, the ability to have tech plant related vehicles, that being MBTs and Liberators, to be pulled from a certain base without a connection required. You can also improve base defenses with overheat buffs and add infantry health regeneration as well. Again, some pretty basic stuff for now, but I look forward to seeing what they will do in the long run. Now, there are a couple of other smaller things, I'm not going to have time to get through all of them, so the patch notes are linked in the description down below, but one thing I have to mention here is that the Orcs Spitfires have been removed in this patch, and not a moment too soon in my opinion, and instead we're getting a new deployable called the Ordnance Dampener that will give off an aura effect that will grant all infantry targets and max suits within its radius a level 1 flak armor buff, which I can see being huge in point holds as well, and once again, a rather meta choice in the grand scheme of things. Again, I see the point hold meta in this update being changed significantly. Implants are also getting a couple of shakeups as well, including the fan favorite survivalist implant. Survivalist 5 will no longer provide a reload buff and will instead heal a player for 150 health over 6 seconds when a shield is broken. Now, on its own, that healing bonus is really nothing, only 25 HP per second over the duration. But when you combine that with other healing items like maybe restoration kits or a medic healing aura, it could very well have some uses, but who knows? Something that will catch a lot of players off guard with this implant now though, is the fact that the speed buff that you gain when your shields are broken will be removed early if you take damage again. So that's going to make for a very interesting change here with this implant, and I think it's going to really shake up the implant meta once again in this game. Revenant will now also grant you a cloak if you revive a player with this implant active at rank 5. Could be useful for down-to-the-wire point holds or revives out in the open, but I'm still not 100% convinced by this implant yet over my current builds on my combat medic. And last but not least, guys, concussion grenades are being nerfed. Now, this was something that I knew some wouldn't be happy about, but in the grand old scheme of balance, there is always going to be people who aren't happy with changes you make. Now, if you are concussed by multiple grenades at once, the turning speed reduction will no longer stack, and you are now just going to only have your controls inverted. Which, I mean, let's be honest, if you're running inverted controls, the stacking of slowed movement speed may actually help you sort of 
disorientate yourself while those controls are inverted. So, who knows? Maybe this is a buff to a certain extent. I don't know. I'm just talking out my ass now. <laughs> And guys, those are some of the key things I noticed with this update. The Tanto got changed, the Daimyo got changed, there's a lot of weapons receiving some tweaks, and in addition to that, a lot of other stuff that got bug fixed as well. Again, I'm going to leave you guys the opportunity to go ahead and check all of that out in the description down below via the patch notes. But guys, that concludes today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to backhand that like button, and if you're new to the channel, backhand that subscribe button whilst you're at it to keep up to date with all things that I'm releasing in the future. Guys, Planet Side 2 is well and truly on the march. We've got some more content that I would like to go over um, that came out of the dev stream in future videos, so be sure to keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, as always, guys, my social media links are the best way to keep up to date with my content, so be sure to follow those as well. Once again, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. Peace out, and I will see you guys on the next one. Take care, guys. Have a good one.